I'm sorry to keep you waiting before we start um, business. Uh, I was just discussing with uh, my colleagues an email we received from uh, a uh, Ms. Uh, Duru uh, of Law 360. It's not clear from her email whether she's in court. Is she? No, none of you is Ms. Duru. She says she's attending the live streamed appeal hearing, which I assume means she's watching it on live stream. Uh, I'll, I'll read what it says. She's a journalist with Law 360, Alexis Nexus Legal Newswire. I'm covering today's live stream appeal hearing and will be writing a story about today's proceedings. I've been unsuccessful in my request to the parties for their skeleton arguments. Because the legal basis for asking for them. Could I ask for the court's assistance in asking the parties for copies of their skeleton arguments today? When a journalist is actually in court, it is routine and indeed is a requirement under the um, uh, practice direction that they be supplied with copies of the skeleton arguments. Um, I, you, I suspect this comes as a surprise to counsel at least, so you probably aren't in a position to comment on her statement that she has been unsuccessful in her requests to the parties. Um, Actually, my lord, I can comment on yes. that. Yes. Um, during the course of this morning, my learned junior received an email um, which he informed me of at lunchtime, um, requesting a copy of the skeleton argument. But because we were doing other things at lunchtime, right. I'm afraid I rather prioritised the other things that we were doing because I would have to take instructions and, and inform my instructing solicitor of it. I yep. don't know whether my learned friend has received something similar. Uh, when, in fact, um, in the printing, which you now find on your desks, uh, my lord, uh, I did spot an email that was reached at 11.09. Uh, at the time, like my learned friend, I was attending to other matters. Yes. So I'm well, look, I, I the parties are not... If that is right, and I, of course, accept it from you, um, uh, I, I think it's a pity Ms. Duru didn't... Um, make it clear when she said she'd be unsuccessful in her request that she'd only made them halfway through the morning. Maybe there's more to it than you, you, it may be requests to your solicitor, so I'm not criticising anyone. But the bottom line is I can't see any reasonable objection, and um, uh, could I encourage you to, uh, to supply them to her or those behind you um, forthwith? Of course. I think probably I'll, uh, I'll say at this point that I will take instructions, but I can't at the moment see any objection. No discourse, as Ms. Duru is no doubt watching, intended to her by not having replied over the lunch break. No, 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 quite. Well, I'm, I'm not intending to criti criticise uh, uh, anyone, but I, um, as I say, I can't see any reasonable objection. Uh, my Lord, yes. Uh, my junior is um, concerned that it, it may be that she would expect it now during the course of the afternoon. If sorry, the, who was expecting? The, the, so, um, the, the, the person who the, requested it. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, might expect it during the course of this afternoon. Um, that may not be possible, but certainly, um, once the court day has finished, we will send the skeleton argument, if that is... All right. Uh, I, I can see, and your junior quite rightly has other priorities. If she'd asked beforehand, he could have dealt with them. But assuming someone can find the time, it's only a very short business to send them by email. You, you've got her address. Um, it's not a question of sending around a courier with a hard copy. No, no. Um, look, I'm just going to leave it. Um, uh, as can it be done as soon as practicable without prejudicing your getting on with your primary job of, re of representing your clients? Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm, uh, it's rather difficult for me to address Ms. Duru, um, but I'm guessing she's watching, and um, uh, 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 I hope that satisfies her. Yes. Um, my Lord, if I can trespass on your time for a further two minutes. Yes. Perhaps five. Um, just in relation to the travel preparatoire. Um, yes. And that is what I was doing at, at lunchtime. Yes. Um, it is, of course, right that they're taken into account by virtue of Section 3 of the Act. Um, the, I, I think they are, the, the names of them are transposed. So the one that's headed Plotter is actually general. Yes, I know. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it's just I was doing it in a rush this morning. Right. Um, the Genard one I don't propose to address the court on um, because it's, it gives the background and context of what, of what has happened. But the Slosser one um, I, I would ask to address the court yes. on. In relation to that one, um, it makes it clear that different member states have different concepts of domicile and that it is not thought to be appropriate to um, lay down the uniform rule um, in, in the convention. Um, but that it would be a yeah, I, I'm sorry I don't want to pick you up but it is quite important 
it says that the meaning of the term domicile in the different member states differs to some extent, but the thrust of it is that the broad concept is similar, yes. except for UK and Ireland. Yes. Right, yes. carry on. And then at paragraph 72b, it makes that point that it differs from the continental concept and then sets out how. Um, one of those, passing over the rest of that paragraph to which I'll come back, one of those is in relation um, to the concept of seat of a company in continental law, which doesn't, of course, um, concern us at all. Um, but in relation to the personal domicile of, of an individual, that's covered in paragraph 72b. And there are a number of problematic issues, if I can put it in that way, which arise from the fact, or are said to arise from the fact, that the concept differs from, the, in uh, Ireland of the UK, differs from the continent. The first one is the the fact the concept doesn't refer to a person's connection with a place or residence, but to roots. And I read that as being a reference to the fact that domicile could be inherited previously. Um, but that's not where we are at all, um, because the residence that the appellant prays in aid arises entirely as a result of his own yes. um, activities, if I can put it in that way. Um, and there is a, a concern about domicile being linked to a particular place, or residence being um, linked to a particular place. And this is where um, Mr. State is in a peculiar position because of his, by virtue of the, the work that he does and where he goes, because um, his witness statement tells you that he was stationed in Halton in Buckinghamshire, Cosford in Wolverhampton, Cumbria, um, Lincolnshire, and then Cyprus. So that's where his postings were, which are overwhelmingly um, within England and Wales, uh, well, are within England and Wales until um, 2016. I'm sorry, I don't, Cyprus. yes. Uh, um Where are we going? What's the, what's the, what's the, what's the point? What, what's the point you're trying to get out of, or maybe rebut? I don't know, but trying to get out of the Schlosser report, get out of is strictly speaking what we. Sorry, I'm expressing myself badly. Is there a particular point you want to make in your favour, which you get out of the Schlosser report? There's a point. Well, if you if you're talking about rebutting some point that you think may be made, wait and see whether Mr. Mackenzie makes it. The point about the Schlosser report is that it's. It refers to a number of problems, and the, the one of the things that it talks about is the fact that a person always has one domicile. It's very difficult to change it. But as we know, because we've looked at the authorities, now a person can have two domiciles, and it's possible to have two. No, the authorities don't deal with. We haven't seen any authorities about domicile at all. Uh, sorry, residents. Beg your pardon. Um, so this is the best love point that you can have more than one place of residence. And that answers the problem. Okay. And I, so I say the authorities are consistent with um, what the Slosser concerns were and have answered them. Yeah, okay, no, fine. Thank you. Uh, well, unless you have any further queries, those are my submissions. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. McKenzie. Thank you, Maud. Um, I should say I will try as best I can to uh, heed the guidance uh, from your Lordship just before the short adjournment regarding uh, the court's familiarity by this point with the authorities. Yes. I will uh, no doubt be moved on if I'm repeating. Yes, and of course it's not meant to stop you going to anything you feel you need to go to, of course. Well, in terms of the roadmap for submissions, my Lord, uh, that we're going to start with the appellate cases of Levine, Bank of Dubai, and then Davis. There is, of course, a fourth appellate authority of Brownlee in the case, but I think the letter Fred and I agree it doesn't take court anywhere at this stage. I'll then address you on the issue of distinct break, as it's referred to in Davis, or abandonment, as my learned friend refers to it in her submissions. In summary, uh, it's my submission that, first, if the requirement does apply... I tell Right. I, I, speaking for myself, my colleagues may 
they can't kick me under the table. Nothing I like least than less than having submissions trailed and then made. If you are to say, if you say briefly, this is what my submission is going to be. You'll find us asking you questions about it. In, um, I'm. You're going to deal with distinct break and abandonment. We'll wait till you get to it to hear it. I'll, yep. I'll come to that shortly, my lord. Yes. Um, then we'll we'll deal with the other authorities, and then we'll come back to residents in this case, absent the the concept of distinct break. Looking at mm -hmm. what we're directed to do by uh, the 2001 order, which there is now a copy of on your desk uh, as amended. Uh, and in, I'm not going to take you to that, uh, my lord. You've already looked at the same text. Yeah. But the two points that I draw from the text of it itself is, firstly, we're directed to look at whether or not someone is resident. And without getting Clintonian about it, um, it is important to focus on what the word is is doing in that sentence. It is a present tense. Yeah. And secondly, the fact that within the test of domicile, the concept of residence and the concept of substantial connection are doing different things. And in fact, the concept of substantial connection only gets a look in once residence is established. Yeah. So that's our starting point. We then come on to Levine, because yeah. this case is all about what is meant by residence. And I'll come back a bit later to what you referred to as the hidden implications, potentially, of your decision in this case, my lord. But it's worth noting that we're looking at Levine, because what the court is being asked to do is to construe the word reside in its ordinary context. The courts have taken from Levine a tax case, the use of the word reside there, apply that in the jurisdictional context and various other contexts. We've already looked at Fox, which is uh, one of the electoral cases. So th that is just a fairly what we're doing here. So if I could take you, uh, please, to page 16 of the authorities. Yeah. Yep. briefly in terms of the facts of the case, which the court is familiar with, it's worth remembering the amount of time that Mr. Levine was spending in the country in the relevant periods where the commissioners determined he was resident. It was, in each year, upwards of 19 weeks. 19 to 22 weeks spent either in one continuous spell or in two spells. And that's set out in the table uh, on page 16 of the bundle. His reasons for coming to England in those years, because of course we're going to come on to the settled patterns of life, um, are set out at the top of page 70. And those are, in summary, obtaining medical advice, visiting relatives, participating in religious observances, and dealing with tax affairs. What um, rather neatly, was it like at some there, called the requirements of family, uh, the requirements of uh, the calls of interest, friendship and piety. Yeah. Yes, my lord. Um, and another phrase which keeps occurring to me throughout this case is the ties that bind, essentially. Uh, and these are the, the very tight ties that are being referred to there. These are the things he was doing each time he came to the country. These were the things which called him to the country each time. We then turn over the page. You've already been taken to um, the first sentence, which is in the sidelining. That's, in many ways, where everything in this case starts, and perhaps uh, the court may take the view where everything in this case should end. Um, the next sentence, though, is important as well. That's the one that begins five lines down in the sidelining, with the words, no doubt. So which page are we on? Uh, page 18 of the authority yeah, bundle. You'll see um, a paragraph that begins, my lords, and then five lines down after referring to the OED. Yep. No doubt this definition must, for present purposes, be taken subject to any modification which may result from the terms of the Income Tax Act and schedules. Subject to that observation, it may be accepted as an accurate indication of the meaning of the word reside. Uh, the reason I emphasize that, my lord, is that even at this stage, the House of Lords was careful to note that the definition in tax cases has to be taken subject to any modification from the legislation. And in my submission, that's important when we come to look at what's being said in Davis. Um, the Lord Chancellor went on to refer to what he referred to as different categories of um, persons who may be resident in the jurisdiction. 
The first is the Master Mariner, who we've already uh, discussed today, Your uh, Lord. The second begins at the top of page 19. That's a person who has his home abroad and visits the United Kingdom from time to time for temporary purposes without setting up an establishment in this country is not considered to be resident in England. Now, these categories, my lord, are obviously not intended to be strict answers in every case. Uh, they're certainly not expressed to be so. But they are, in many ways, shorthand for the kinds of cases in which Lord Cave was saying a person would or would not be resident or, as we come to see with the later ones, it would or would not be difficult to say so. The third category begins, and you've been referred to this, uh, approximately 10 or 12 lines down, uh, but a man may reside in more than one place. Uh, I won't read that. That's already been read to you. And the fourth uh, begins after the words, the above cases are comparatively simple, but more difficult questions arise when the person sought to be charged has no home or establishment in any country, but lives his life in hotels or at the houses of his friends. So these are our difficult case, this fourth category. These are our peripatetic or itinerant uh, individuals. They're persons who have no establishment in any place, and the commissioners, as it was in this case, are then seeking to determine whether or not they are someone who is subject to income tax. Now, Mr. Levine, was a category four case. He was someone who uh, had no establishment anywhere until, and we see this over the page on page 20. So it may not matter, but isn't there, a f if we're going to divide this up into categories, doesn't a f uh, the wanderer who starts eight lines up from the bottom, isn't that a fifth category? I, I think it may even be, um, or is it, a sort of, is it a subcategory of four? That's exactly what I was going to say. That may be a subcategory of my four categories because we have two types of wanderers. We have uh, those who wander but are entirely within the United Kingdom. We can't say where they reside, but we know that they reside in the United Kingdom. Yeah, I think logically, I think it is a fifth category. So they are quite a lot different. Four. Oh, I see. Yes, no, I, all right. It, uh, let's, let's not spend too much on time categorising. I, I see you could look at it either way. Yep. I, I, as, as you say, Lord, I don't think it matters for our purposes, save to note this, that it's very clear that Mr Levine was regarded as being someone in the final category. Uh, and we see that uh, if we go over the page at the top of the paragraph beginning turning to the facts. But what's important for our purposes is when he ceased to be a member of that category. Because if we read on, um, in, the, in the line beginning of the year 1919, we see, he then went abroad from time to time, but continued to live in hotels either here or in France, and he did not actually find a home abroad until the month of January 1925, when he took lease of a flat in Monte Carlo. That's the point at which, as determined by the commission as not held by the House of Lords, he ceased to be the subject of English income. So he becomes non-resident when he finds his flat in Monte Carlo. When he has an establishment. That's when he goes from being in the final category to being in the second category. And we know from looking back over the page of Whitehouse Cave that someone in the second category with a home abroad who visits for temporary purposes is not resident. And at that point, we stop even counting the number of weeks that Mr. Levine is present in the jurisdiction. That, that's our starting point in terms of how the word reside is to be understood. That is binding on this court in these circumstances by way of Bank of Dubai, which is our next case. Now, you weren't taken to this case, so if, if I can just uh, briefly, it begins on page 30. The judgment of this court given in 1996 
Lord Justice Savile was um, the only judge to give a substantive judgment. The other two members of the court agreed with him. This was a case in which it was alleged that Mr Abbas could be served out of the jurisdiction on the basis that he was domiciled here under what was then the rules of the Supreme Court and the jurisdictional gateways. We see at paragraph 10 on page 33 that reference is had directly to Levine and that Lord Justice Savile concludes that on the basis of Levine, it seems to me that a person is resident for the purpose of section 41.3, which um, is of course, that's the one that we put in the authority bundle initially. Uh, that is the exact same text as uh, the order in 2001, serving the same purpose for the direct predecessor to the recast regulation. So in my submission, that there's no question, and it's not suggested from a learned friend, that this is not directly applicable. That is the test that this court is therefore bound to apply. Then goes on, uh, paragraph 11, a settled or usual place of abode, of course, connotes some degree of permanence or continuity. And it's worth noting that in the passage which immediately follows that, uh, Lord Justice Savile criticises, or not criticises, but thinks Mr Justice Potter was wrong to say that the Act established a low threshold for residence. So that there is no suggestion for that in the Act, as he said. The other thing in my submission which we take from that passage, uh, that, that's where it says, it is true the subsection provides a rebuttable presumption of substantial connection if the residence has lasted for the three months or more, but provides no guidance on the question whether or not the person has become resident. But we also see that an echo of one of my very first points, my lord, which was that we are dealing with two completely different things when we look at residence and substantial connection, and we don't use the latter to get to the former. But um, we may need some help when we, I'm sure you'll come to this in, in fuller colour, but there may be some factors that might denote substantial connection, which would also be relevant to the multifactorial issue of residence. Of course. Lady. So they're not mutually exclusive. They're not mutually exclusive. They're different targets. They are different targets, and we'll, we'll come on to look at exactly what um, what is meant by residence, um, going further than the settled abode, which all of the words we're using here um, can and are being argued about what precisely they mean. But they are different concepts, and for example, the fact that someone is a citizen of a country means they have a connection with the country doesn't mean they are resident in the country. And I would go on to say, this is something of the point in the case, but the fact that someone is serving in the armed forces of the country, the fact that someone is employed by the crown of a country, does not mean that is the country in which they are living. It doesn't mean they, that's the country in which they are resident. No, but it, is it, I think it's, it's helpful to you to some extent, isn't it, that it's necessarily implicit in three that you can be resident somewhere without having any substantial connection. And although that wouldn't be relevant as such, the question of um, the appellant's residence in England and Wales, which, which is what he's concerned to establish, it's relevant to the other side of the coin, which is whether he was uh, resident in uh, in. Uh, Cyprus, but was what said it was. Well, he was, he slept there, but he had no real connection. You know, there was all an English community and everything. Um, that wouldn't be a reason why he wasn't resident there, which then helps you to say he was resident there, but he wasn't resident in England, Wales. Am I? Uh, is is no, that a fair point? Or it, precisely, well, the extreme example would be, but the one that's very illustrative. If we imagine a cloistered order of monks or nuns, uh, a person who leaves. England to go and live in a cloistered order, has no connection with the outside world at all, is living a completely ascetic life, may be said, as Melinda Friends. I think it's a less strong case than hers, actually, because the point is that um, he does obviously have a very substantial connection in Cyprus with England um, because of the whole ethos of why you're there. Th this is precisely why I think this is an important passage yeah. to emphasise. Okay. Okay, because. Thanks. It, just as the statute itself does by splitting it into um, 3A and 3B, whether we're in the order, paragraph 9, or whether we're within the Act itself, uh, this is recognition by the Court of Appeal that these are distinct issues. Uh, one point to note, uh, just a couple of other short points to pick up before moving on from this judgment, because I'd like to spend quite a bit of time on Davis. 
is by the time the Court of Appeal came to actually determine this case, this was being treated as a rehearing. Um, there had been issues below with essentially Mr. Justice Potter relying on facts which turned out not to be true and very substantial facts. So that's the context in which um, the facts are being analysed. If we go to paragraph 15 on page 35, we see that at the very top, uh, Mr. Abbas himself has said through his solicitors that he resides in Pakistan with his brother, and then goes on to say and that he does not reside in London. Now, the fact that he resided in Pakistan with his brother, Mr. Abbas also appears to have had interest in Belgium, doesn't appear to have been the subject of challenge from reading the judgment. So that would put us prima facie either in one of the law case category two cases, someone with a home abroad but not in England, or a category three case, that is someone with two homes. We then go on, and, and you can see this, my lord, my lady, further down uh, in the paragraph. What's being discussed here is whether or not Mr. Abbas was resident at a particular flat in London. There were disputes about ownership, whether it was owned by a nominee, uh, and essentially this was an action. It looks like the ultimate goal was to enforce into the property in the flat. But what was said about the flat in 15 was, he says that he has stayed on a few occasions at the flat, but usually with, his, with friends or at hotels during his time in England which is on holiday for up to about two months a year. So the court had before it, in this case, evidence of someone with a home abroad who is spending two months a year, up to two months a year, in the UK, in England. What was concluded in that case was that on the evidence, uh, in particularly by reference to the passage I've just cited, Mr. Abbas was not resident at the flat. I mean, no, that's... Uh, the way the reasoning works, because we see that at paragraph 17. Says, I'm unpersuaded that there is a good arguable case that in August 1994, that being the date of issue, Mr. Abbas was resident in this country. Since I'm not persuaded on the available material, that it is well arguable that the flat can properly be described, so far as Mr. Abbas is concerned, as a settled place of abode, or as the bank put it, a home. Now, the important point to note is this, then. The Court of Appeal Lord Justice Savile looked at whether or not there was a home, there was a place that could be called a home. And that's unsurprising when we go back to Levine, to the fact that we're in category two or three, there's a home abroad, there's a residence abroad. Because at that stage, what Lord Cave was saying is, you are either not resident in this country, or you're resident here if you have an establishment. That's different from then the more complicated cases of the itinerant, the peripatetic. Uh, whether they're entirely within the country or whether they are spending some of their time <coughs> in hotels in England, some of their time in hotels in France. So in this case, the Court of Appeal did regard it as important that there was no home in the country. There was no place that you could say, this is where I'm living. So that's all I want to take from uh, Abbas and by Bank. If I could take you on then over the next page to page 37 of Davis. <coughs> um, it's always quite a nice thing to be able to uh, tell the court that while this is a 37 page judgment uh, it, we're only going to be looking at very specific parts of it they're short passages but they do need to be dealt with extremely carefully because they are really the origin of Milan Friend's submission that what you're looking for is abandonment here the facts have been alluded to by my Lord Lord Justice Underhill essentially the facts in the Davis cases there was the other case as well but the Davis cases were um, both defend both applicants moved to Belgium in order, it seems for tax efficient purposes, uh, to change the pattern of their lives. And then this was a case in which they um, were relying, they said, on the guidance which had been issued by the Inland Revenue. And it's important to note, and if I could take to page 41 of the authorities bundle, I should say, Lord Mance dissented, uh, but Lord Wilson, uh, the other, the remaining judges of the Supreme Court agreed with his judgment. Um, if, we, if you look at the letter D on the left-hand side of the page, on page 41, you'll see a sentence, the present appeals require the court mainly to construe the guidance in the booklet, that being a booklet issued in 1999 on tax liabilities of residents and non-residents. Now, it's this case and Shulman, which I'll address briefly, uh, which, as I said, is relied on for this distinct break, this ground, this, this abandonment ground of appeal. If we assume for now 
that a distinct break is in fact required, then we look at how it would be applied. And for that, we start with paragraph 20 on page 47. The court's already been taken to this. We'll come on to the first sentence, of which is very important, but more important to the question of whether or not a distinct break is required in this context. But if we pick it up um, in the se second sentence, five lines down at the right-hand side of the page, the word the, it's the requirement of a distinct break mandates a multifactorial inquiry. In my view, however, the controversial references in the judgment of Lord Justice Moses in the decision under appeal to need in law for severance of social and family ties pitch the requirement at any rate by implication at too high a level. The distinct break relates to the pattern of the taxpayer's life in the UK, and no doubt it encompasses a substantial loosening of social and family ties. But the allowance which I refer of limited visits to the UK on part of the taxpayer who has become non-resident clearly foreshadows their continued existence. Severance of such ties is too strong a word. And, my lord, my lady, you've already been referred to uh, Lord Hope's uh, paragraph 63, it's on page 60. I don't need to take you to that again now. But it's at this stage helpful to consider the learned friend's submission that what the judge should have been looking for was abandonment of the residents in England. It, in my submission, that is, if anything, Lord Justice Moses' severance, given another name, and given, in my submission, a more demanding inquiry. Because, as with the arguments in Davis about severance, the question of abandonment, it, I, think, I think the word turning one's back was also used. That is setting it too high, because the continued existence of a connection is not inconsistent with residing somewhere else. Th this goes back to my Lord's point that it's possible to have a substantial connection to somewhere without residing there. What's more that Actually, my point was the opposite one, but still. Well, f forgive me, my Lord. Um, uh, but your point. My, my point, which um, no doubt my Lord uh, has heard many times now. Um, the word abandonment, as used by my learned friend, there's an additional aspect to the concept of abandonment. There's a, intrinsic in the word abandonment, there is some aspect of animus or intention. A person can't, it doesn't make sense to talk about someone abandoning something if they haven't intended to do so. And it would be highly strange use of the word to say that you could inadvertently abandon something. What Lord Hope says, and I actually uh, don't seek to pitch it as high as my learned friend I think thinks I do, uh, is that intention is relevant to the inquiry. And intention is going to be relevant to the inquiry of a distinct break to whether or not those ties that Lord Wilson refers to are loosened. But as Lord Hope says, it is not determinative. You do not require intention. What I would also say, in terms of the concept of abandonment, is that given the Supreme Court has expressed the requirement they are referring to in this passage, as in, in the clear words they have, a distinct break in the pattern of the taxpayer's life in the UK, there's no need to gloss that by saying a distinct break amounting to abandonment of the taxpayer's life in the UK. So I say abandonment is certainly the wrong concept. When we also look at distinct break, um, it's worth looking at back at page 47 uh, to paragraph 21, which my lord referred to earlier. Uh, that's, uh, forgive me, I think it was in fact my lady who was spoken. It was my lady, yes. Um, this is uh, Lord Wilson's uh, reference to the case of Coombe. Uh, Coombe was the case, con which we will come back to, concerning a UK resident moving to New York to act as a broker, but still spending significant portions of the year in a given year, up to half of the year, in the UK that if a taxpayer left the UK to pursue employment abroad, which is full-time, likely not only he would cease to be a UK resident, but he would also escape from being deemed still to be a UK resident under the statutory provision. That reference to the statutory provision we will come back to. From the fact that the employment was full-time, it was likely to follow that he had made a distinct break in the pattern of his life in the UK. This is um, perhaps not axiomatic, but it, it follows naturally that if one takes up full-time employment in another place, uh, then one's life is changed. And that's what we're looking for, a distinct break, the pattern of one's life changing. It's at this stage that I'd like to pick up briefly um, the Shulman decision. Uh, that's at page 139 for reference.
this is what one of my learned friend and I have been doing the same thing in my head, referred to as the oligarch cases, uh, specifically concerned with the residence at the time of a Mr. Bogolyubov, who I will refer to as the second defendant um, going forward. But the claim form was delivered to an address which had formerly been his family home. He argued that by the time it was so delivered, by, in fact, by the time the claim form was issued, he was no longer a resident in the UK, therefore no longer domiciled in England, therefore under the Lugano Convention, he was entitled to be uh, sued in Switzerland. Thankfully, we don't need to get into the specific Lugano Convention, but that's how, in that case, we came to the uh, conversation about residence. Now, in that case, reference was had to Davis. It's the only other case before you which refers to Davis. Um, the judge, and this was Mr. Justice Barling, uh, at page 144, paragraph 23 onwards, recalls that essentially the same paragraphs that, were, that have been cited to the court by the claimant uh, were cited to him. There is no record anywhere of whether or not there was discussion of whether or not that was a requirement which in fact applied in a jurisdiction case rather than a tax case. Um, it appears to have gone without issue and because of the decision that was made, was, we'll see that it was held it was a distinct break, it wouldn't have made any difference anyway. Um, taking you on to page 161. Do you suggest a distinct break doesn't apply in a jurisdiction? I, I do, my lady. You say do, even distinct, but I've got your point about abandonment. You say abandonment puts it too high, but you go further, do you say? You say there's no concept of distinct break even in jurisdiction cases. I, I do, my lady. Um, without um, in, incurring uh, Lord Justice Arnold's warning again, <laughs> um, the, the submission I was trailing at that point is the same one now, which is I say first the court doesn't need to decide in this case whether or not distinct break's required because here we have a very clear one. But secondly, in any event, I say that distinct break is not a requirement in a jurisdiction case because it arises from uh, section 334, the provision that was at the time section 334 that my lord referred to in argument. And I'm, that's why I want to come back to Davis. I'm not done with Davis. Uh, but we look at that for the secondary argument. But, but in order to lose residence rather than merely acquire an additional residence, there must be some change in the pattern of life, to use a more neutral term. What, what, what's the nature of that change if it isn't a break? This is where we come back to the discussion about over what period are we looking at matters and what do we mean by asking if someone is resident at a particular time. Distinct break in at least evokes a notion that one upends one's life in a more sudden way, in a more, you can say that on this date this happened. If what we're looking at instead is asking the question that the statute requires us to do, is this person resident at a particular time? We, have a, we can have a count of a previous lifestyle, a previous residence, but we don't need to start, it, start the other way around, essentially. Uh, what's already been discussed, what would happen if a claimant... No, I, I wonder whether everyone's having this battle unnecessarily. Um, you must be right that to decide whether someone is resident somewhere, you don't logically have to decide whether there's been a distinct break from somewhere where they were living presently or previously. But on a case where they have moved from one place to another and there is an issue as to whether the previous one has remained their home instead of the one to which they're moving, the concept of distinct break is fine, isn't it? And then, but but uh, it, then you can make all sorts of sub-points about, yes, but distinct break doesn't mean it has to be dramatic and so on. But it, it, this is the sort of problem that lawyers get themselves into and it's not really necessary to have a distinct break doctrine or anything like that, is it? That, that is precisely my submission, my lord, is that it is not necessary to have that doctrine. There's a reason... All right, but on some facts, something like it will be a relevant question. Precisely. It's a necessary question. It, go, it goes into the multifactorial analysis that we look at, the fact-sensitive question of residence. Of, of course, it's something the court can look at. I'm not suggesting... And may have to look at. And, and, they, and they have to look at. Is what, what was the pattern of one's life at a particular time? That, that is going to be a relevant question where it's put in issue in a particular case. What's more important is not whether one uses the verb break or distinct break, but that it's the pattern of life that is changing, not merely physical location. So that the test does suggest, at least for the purposes of determining whether you've lost a residence, 
as opposed to acquired a different one or an additional one, uh, you do have to look, as Pregas submits, not merely at physical location, but other factors, ties, whatever expression one might need to, one might want to use, which are within the expression pattern of life. And you can have a break or a chain, or you can have a break which occurs gradually. It doesn't have to be a, an immediate break. What matters really is the change in the in the pattern of life. Is that Yes, my lord. I, th I think that the reason the reason I said the word yes there sl slightly hesitantly sounding is because starting at the point of change is always going to be putting the inquiry backwards. What the test requires us to look at is is residence. So it can be part of the conversation that we then have about whether or not truly what we're looking at is residence. But if we start by saying, if we start an assessing someone's residence by saying, well, three years before that, he was resident in a different place, then in my submission, we're not doing what the statute compels us to do, which is asking the question, is he resident? And I, I, I entirely... Um, I'm afraid I don't, I don't entirely follow that. Leave entirely on one side whether a person is resident in somewhere that we're not looking at, either additionally or in substitution. What we're concerned with is whether he is resident in a place in which he has previously undoubtedly been resident. Now, why is it a wrong approach to look at what, if anything, has changed from the time when he was undoubtedly resident there? If one is asking the question, is he still resident there at the time that we are concerned with, which, as we know, is, no, is not a scintilla temporis on the date of the issue of the proceedings. It involves some uh, broader period of time. Why, why is that? A, I don't understand why that's a wrong approach in principle. My Lord, I think the, the, the issue in part is that it focuses the inquiry. And it, it may be no more than, it, with, with sufficient care, uh, the same result will be reached yeah. in each case. Uh, can I read, but I, th I thought you were saying it is dangerous to make it the starting point of the inquiry, because the ultimate question is always, are they resident at the, at the moment in question? I don't think you're wanting to be understood to say that it may not be a relevant part of the overall assessment, may actually, in a particular case, be a, a crucial part of the overall assessment. but. It's not the question in the case. Precisely. The, um, and in which case, we may just be arguing about emphasis and approach rather than about any real difference between you and what my Lord is putting to you. I, I, think, it, I think it is a question of emphasis. Yeah. Um, uh, in my submission, we start with Levine. And unless there's a reason to depart from Levine, which does not involve the question of distinct break, uh, it, does it does say that in certain cases we look at all the circumstances because they're different. But unless there's a reason to depart from it, we start with Levine. And distinct break can come into our inquiry in a relevant case. But to suggest, as my learned friend does and as it was accepted in Shulman, that in certain cases that is the test, is in my submission to put it far too highly. Aren't you boxing us in more than just a bit? Can't we look at Levine and see what it says? And then part of the argument here is that this man was plainly resident in England and Wales until 2016. So the issue in this case is, is he still resident in England and Wales? And that's what we're looking at. And then we have back to 28 little 2, built on uh, Davies. And I'm looking at um, the Barling uh, case that says, for residents to cease, which is the issue here, there should be a distinct break in the sense of the alteration of a pattern of the individual's life in the UK. Why, why do we have to splice these things out and look at them in different sections and not look at things? Can't we just look at it all together? Milady, that is my case, uh, and I apologise if I'm putting it poorly, okay. but my understanding of my learned friend's case is that in a case where someone has been resident in England, mm. you don't start by putting it all together. You start by saying, is there a distinct break or is there abandonment, as she puts it? Okay. And if there isn't, then there is residence. I'm not sure that I'd understood her to be quite so formulaic in how she was presenting her case, but that's, that's my mistake. I, I, I take that, lady on the basis of the grounds of appeal and the Scouten argument, uh, and the submissions which she's noted was rejected below, that the judge had to start with, by ask, the judge had to ask the question whether or not there had been abandonment. I, I, I don't suggest more, and I don't think I could on the authorities. It may, it may be helpful for me to set up what I say about Davis now, 
about this question. I'll come back to why I say in this case a distinct break is clearly made out. Uh, but if I could take you back to Davis and back to paragraph 14, which appears on page 45. Part of the reason that I say that I, first I don't think it would be correct, but I'm, I, I think this court is also bound, would be bound to tell me that I was incorrect, uh, it, to say that the concept of loosening of ties is irrelevant, is the end of paragraph 14, because we'll come on to the context in which it entered the lexicon, but what Lord Wilson says is that the phrase is not an inapt description of the degree of change in pattern of the, an individual's life in the UK which will be necessary if a cessation of his settled or usual votes take place. This goes back to, uh, I think, what uh, was my Lord was just Popperwell's point, that while it may not need to be as dramatic as a distinct break, we're looking at the degree of change here that is going to be relevant. I'm not suggesting that is irrelevant. Uh, and I may, I may be boxing against something that's not being said, but what I understand the case against me to be is that there needs to be that distinct break. Otherwise, uh, there is residue. And that essentially it is this self-sustaining concept. It is the case that a claimant could put in evidence that they had been resident five years ago, remain silent as to anything else, and say, because there's no distinct break before the court, I have established that I am still resident. That's, that's why this submission, it, in my submission, is relevant. To take this very briefly, then, uh, we have a paragraph 15, section 334 of the, tax, of the income tax legislation at the time, which uh, has already been referred to, which provides that if ordinary residence has been in the United Kingdom, and that's why I say this is a different case, because this was looking at previous residents explicitly on the legislation, whereas legislation we're concerned with looking, looks at present residents, looks at is resident, has been in the United Kingdom, be assessed or charged to income tax, notwithstanding that at the time the assessment charge is made, he may have left the United Kingdom if he is so left for the purpose only of occasional residence abroad. Then goes on, paragraph 16, set out, if an individual who has been resident and ordinarily resident in the UK ceases to be resident in the UK, he will nevertheless be deemed to have remained resident in the UK if he has left the UK only for the purpose of occasional residence abroad. So this is a deeming provision which exists in the tax legislation, which does not exist in the jurisdiction and domicile legislation that we're dealing with. And that's where we differ in terms of the context in which we're looking at reside. Then from paragraph 17, Lord Wilson notes that the effect of a predecessor to this provision, this is what's referred to in paragraph 21, <coughs> when we saw the reference to statutory provision. Um, Lord Wilson notes that the predecessor of this provision was noted in Levine itself. Um, but paragraph 18 and 19 are where we see the advent of the distinct break coming into the fray. And that is the decision of Mr. Justice Nichols in Reed and Clark. Um, this is a case where Ms. Clark had been resident in the UK. He moved to Los Angeles and made his home there, returning just over a year later. The commissioners ruled that Mr. Clark had not been resident or ordinarily resident in the UK, uh, and the revenue appealed. Mr. Justice Nichols upheld that, and if we look at D, we can see that he quoted from, and this has been quoted elsewhere in the case quoted as well, from the case of Shah. Uh, quote from Lord Scarman, the ordinary residence referred to a man's abode in a particular place or country which he has adopted um, for settled purposes as part of the regular order of his life for the time being. Uh, that, that is a typographical error where it says all the time being, uh, whether of short or of long duration. Uh, then goes on uh, to note that Miss Justice Nichols was expressly adopting language of distinct break from a case of the Court of Session which was the Coombe case that's referred to then at paragraph 21. And we have the facts which I've already alluded to, it's the broker who moves abroad uh, and the, but then spends a large part of the year here. Then we have the following explanation below G. In upholding the conclusion that he was not liable to tax as a UK resident for those years, the court proceeded straight to the statutory provision, which then remained in General Rule 3, and concluded the captain had not left the UK for the purpose only of occasional residence abroad. It was implicit in its conclusion that he had left the UK in the sense of becoming non-resident in it. 
When therefore Lord Sands observed there was a distinct break in what he described as the captain's residence in the UK, it was with a view to explaining his conclusion the captain's residence abroad had been more than occasional. In Regan Clark, Miss Justice Nichols applied the phrase in precisely the same context and helpfully added that what was required distinctly to be broken was the pattern of the taxpayer's life. And this is where we come back to the first sentence of paragraph 20. Because what Lord Wilson makes clear in that sentence is that in none of those cases, nor in Davis itself, in order to explain the concept, was it relevant or necessary to make the decision, does the question of distinct break which the court is applying go to the question of actual residence or to the deeming provision in the legislation? And, and that's why I say that insofar as it's being applied as a test in certain tax cases, and referred to as being so in Davis, that's only in the tax cases that that, that happens. The court not only didn't need to decide in any of those cases, but didn't decide. Unlike Lord Wilson and Davis, though, if the court is being asked, as I have understood it to be, to apply a distinct break test, then this court would need to decide. In my submission, the better view is clearly that the concept of distinct break as a test, not as a part of the inquiry, goes to the deeming provision only, because that deeming provision, and we can go back to section 334, applies where the purpose of leaving is only of occasional residence abroad. If we return to uh, that quotation, that explanation of Lord Sands' judgment by Lord Wilson, uh, Lord Sands referred to a distinct break. It was with a view to explaining his conclusion that the captain's residence abroad had been more than occasional. That is, that the requirement for the statute's application was not met. And so that's where the origin of the distinct break comes from. The other thing uh, I would say is that any requirement for a distinct break glosses the meaning of the word residence again. It's an unnecessary addition to the test, which we already have. Uh, the reason it applies in tax cases, we know it comes from the tax legislation. I referred uh, your worship to my leadership earlier to the fact that in Levine itself, the House of Lords was cognizant that it had to have regard to the fact there may be modification where tax legislation was being involved. And that is why I say, and apologies if this has been a, a waste of the course time, if I've misunderstood my learned friend's submission, that it cannot be part of the test, it does not form part of the test for residents in this context, in the jurisdictional context, and that we need not go further than residents as properly understood which I, I'm not saying, and I, again, I don't think it's open to this court to say that um, a distinct break, a loosening of the ties, cannot be a relevant part of the inquiry. In terms of why we have a distinct break in this case, um, just in order to deal with this as briefly as possible, if I could refer for your notes, uh, Mullers Milady, uh, to page 161. And this is if you're wrong on your primary. This is if I'm, well, my primary submission is the court need not make that decision, uh, but I thought I'd address it because... No, no, of course, uh, you know, yeah. Going back to my primary submission, uh, which is that there is a distinct break in this case if needed. Oh, I see. That's your primary submission. Right. Okay, it doesn't matter. Anyway, if there is a need for a distinct break, help. Um, on, paragraph, on page 161, I'm not going to take the court to it because it's, it's a long paragraph, but for your note, you'll see there's a number of factors that the judge referred to in that case as being relevant in determining that, in fact, the second defendant had ceased to be resident, that there had been a distinct break. So we're in Shulman. In Shulman. And on page 161, that, that the indented paragraph at the top, you say uh, that's all the things that... In, in fact, the paragraph 75 at the bottom. OK. And you'll see within that, um, it's not indented. It may be slightly clearer formatted if it were. No, 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 I was on the wrong paragraph. There's 21 different factors, which Mr. Justice Barling refers to here. In summary, the ones which I think are the most relevant for this court today are that uh, Mr. Bogolyubov arranged for certain persons, being his personal assistant, his wife and his children, to also leave the jurisdiction with him and join him in Switzerland. He made tax arrangements reflecting that he was in Switzerland rather than in England, including entering to landlord overseas uh, arrangements with HMRC. He found accommodation in Switzerland. 
He stopped making payments associated with living in his London house, um, taxes and bills. He engaged in sporting activities in Geneva. He made arrangements for health care to be provided in Switzerland by way of obtaining health insurance. And that on his behalf, res uh, agents of his described his residence as being in Switzerland, specifically lawyers. Why, why does all this help us? This is just all the facts of a completely different case. Uh, M M Lord, as at a, first instance, I, I only want to take you to it briefly because a lot of factors see echoes in this in this case, the one before the court now. Uh, those are, in, in summary, the, the most the clear factors that go to a distinct break in this case, as properly understood, the loosening of the ties. And many of them have already been referred to, but it's worth noting that the, what we have in this case, very little evidence of what the claimant's pattern of life was in England before he moved to Cyprus. We know, in my submission, three things. We know that he worked on the RAF base in Cumbria, and he owned a house there. We don't even know whether or not that had been leased out at the time. Oh, aren't you making a... Surely the straightforward case there was a change in the pattern, or a distinct break in the pattern of his life, was that he went and spent the next five years of his life in in Cyprus with his wife and children. My Lord, that, that's precisely what I'm coming to. I, I would put it that briefly were it not for the fact that this court had granted permission to appeal. All right. Um, the SBA is described as the place where he's living with his wife and children. He's living in accommodation there. His wife and children and he were not there before. They were not living in accommodation on the base before. He was not working on the base before. Everything we know about his life this is this is what this one is referring to what we know about his life before, because we're looking to see if that pattern of life has changed. Everything we know. Well, I mean, whatever life. more we learnt about what his life had been in Cumbria or Lincolnshire or wherever, couldn't affect all what then happened in the next five years, could it? No, my lord. Uh, it's, but, it's perhaps not surprising we haven't heard very much about it. But in terms of Milena friends referred to, I think, I think it was the basket of familial ties. We know that there's family in Gloucester. We know that his family remains in Gloucester. We don't know whether or not he has any contact with his family in Gloucester. We don't know whether he has any contact with his friends in Gloucester. We don't know where he stays when he returns to the UK. None of this is there. It's all evidence which could have been put before the court. It's all evidence which, if a learned friend wants to say, his pattern of life has not changed. If we go back to Mr. Levine, Mr. Levine was attending the same religious observances while still receiving medical advice, he and his wife, was providing care for a brother who was mentally ill. Again, the real point was he coming to this country for half the year. Precisely, Lord. Uh, I want to deal with distinct break briefly. Yeah. Um, I don't think I'm quite able, uh, while putting my submission to deal with quite as briefly as my lordship, maybe you hope I am. No, 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 d um, ignore me. But really what we have here in my submission, as said, we know three things. We know his family in Gloucester, he worked at Aria Scrampton, and we know that he, well, it suggested the court is asked to infer that he lived in a house in Cumbria with his wife and children. We know all of those things changed. Apart from the fact that he had family in Gloucester, we have no idea whether or not he's even contacted them at any stage while he's been living in Cyprus. So, as far as my learned friend as she accepts, if the distinct break, if the abandonment requirement does apply, and if, without that being made out, she, uh, she's successful on her case, she still bears the burden of proof, she accepts that. There is nothing on which the basis of the judge or this court could find that there has not been such a break. Um, Lords and lady, I don't want to take you to each of the first instance decisions which have been cited. Shulman was the one that I thought most important because that is the way in which the case appears to be primarily put. In fact, the learned friend didn't take you to it. Just to make a couple of brief points on things that we, all, that we do find in the other authorities. Uh, if I could take you back to page 85 into the passage from Fox and Sturk and Lord Justice Widgery, which has already been referred to. Which page? Page 85, my lord. This is within the Panagaki case. You've already been referred to two passages within the quotation there, uh, both of which are important. 
First being, a man cannot be said to reside in a particular place unless in the ordinary sense of the word one can say that for the time being he is making his home in that place. And for the time being, in my submission, is important because this goes back to my learned friend's uh, submissions which in many senses uh, harken back to the pre-1982 Act uh, conception of domicile to the true home test which was deprecated in the Schlosser report, which I will come on, I will come on to address more. The other point which is important, and I think I'd read this very differently from a learned friend, is the last sentence of the paragraph. What is said is, some assumption of permanence, some degree of continuity, some expectation of continuity, is a vital factor, and this is the crucial point, which turns simple occupation into residence. And a learned friend emphasised this, essentially to say that you're looking for permanence. But in fact, what this demonstrates is that occupation is required before you can have residence. Now, the degree of occupation may vary, but there has to be actual occupation. You, you cannot, it, th this does not establish that you can have, Milan and Friend said um, that you're looking for the permanence, that's what takes you to residence. But what this shows is that you can't have residence without occupation in my submission. Or certainly, that if permanence is relevant to residence, it is relevant as a factor which is then put on to the question of occupation. That's the role of permanence when we're looking at residence. But one other point to note um, from this judgment is that Mr. Justice Singh, uh, this is at paragraphs 43 and 44, <coughs> uh, referred to the fact that he considered it to be more helpful to look at the evidence as it stood at the material date before the claimant knew that there was a jurisdiction challenge. Uh, at this point, my lord, I'd like to pick up. Uh, there was discussion earlier about what the claimant would say if he were asked where he was living. The, that is not contained, it's not answered anywhere within his witness statements. But what we do know is what he told the doctor in this case. Because uh, my lord, Lord Justice Popwell uh, requested a few days ago that the court be provided with the application and the witness statement in support. If I could take the court to, within that bundle, page 15. It's appended to the particulars of claim which are themselves appended to the statement of Mr. Richards. You want to get the medical report here? The medical report. In the usual way, on the front page of the report, we see claimant's address, and that is given as currently based at RAF Akrotiri Cyprus. It's not given as an address in Cumbria. It's not given as a forwarding address in Gloucester. Uh, we then also go on, just for completeness, over two pages, page with history at the top of it, just after the doctor's qualifications. Background. Corporal Robin Andrew State is a 36-year-old left-hand dominant man who lives at RAF Akrotiri in Cyprus with his wife and two children. That's obviously a statement, this is a report prepared by the doctor, uh, but the surgeon is only going to have learned that from one source, uh, and that is going to be either the claimant or his agent. So that's the evidence as it, as it stood at the time of the application. It's not really your best point. <laughs> no, no, it, it's simply that there have been exchanges today. Where would the claimant say he lived? Uh, well, this, isn't in, this isn't even what the claimant's saying. This is what the doctor interprets from we don't know what was said by the claimant. He may have said, uh, I regard England as my home, but at the moment I'm stationed temporarily in Akrotiri. Doctor says that he lives in Akrotiri. And the doctor's making a Doc's making exactly the distinction that the legislation well, asks the court to between uh, home and living. We're, we're <laughs> I, I, I accept uh, the fact that it's, it's not a point I'm going to lay any further. Third hand stuff like this. Um, one other point uh, I'd like to pick up. If I could take you back to the case of Vestilov, uh, Simon Bryan QC. And if I could take you to page 106, there's a quote from the case of High Tech and Deripaska, which is relevant to Milano Friend's submission that. Uh, the claimant was occupying the house in Cumbria. He was essentially, despite less than a doubt, uh, he was occupying it. Simply like to refer you to uh, what was said by Mr. Justice Eady in that, in the case of Deripaska. There is undoubtedly permanent. For which page are we on? Forgive me, my lord, 106. Mm -hmm. There is undoubtedly permanence and continuity in ownership and indirect occupation but not necessarily when one comes to address residence or abode. 
Where are you, so, where are you reading from? Forgive me. That's uh, five lines down. There's a line beginning with the word residence in quotation. Uh, within, sorry, within the quotation itself from the judgment of Mr. Justice Eady. Uh, that's simply to address the point about effectively indirect occupation. It's the same point that the line of friend seeks to rely on in this case by reference to the Cumbria House was made in that case and in my submission rightly rejected. The last case I'd like to turn up, Mr. Lords, is the case of Kim by Mr. Justice Julian Knowles. That begins on page 195. This was the defamation case between uh, two members of the Korean community in New Malden, two sports journalists. Sorry, I haven't got the page number. Could you give uh, that to me? It me? begins on page 195. The first, one first one page I'd like to take you to is 205. Okay. Okay. Simply to note that in that case, reference was made to the case of Udni by the defendant, which was the 1869 case, which unsurprisingly Mr. Justice Julian Knowles said he didn't find very helpful. But the reason he didn't find it very helpful was it was about the old test for domicile. And so what page are we at? Page 205, I'm at paragraph 37. Lord. Yep. Uh, there's a, the quotation from Lord Westbury, domicile of choice must be a residence not for a limited period or for a particular purpose, but general and indefinite in its contemplation. And that's the old test. Uh, that's the real home test. Uh, and quite rightly, that was rejected as being irrelevant by the judge. But that is, in my submission, through a different method, the test which the claimant asks you to apply today. Because the claimant asks you to look at the substantial connection, the fact that it hasn't been abandoned, the fact that the claimant, in his words, always intended to return to the UK. That's the test which is being rejected. And it was also rejected, if we go ahead to page 209, by Lord Scarman in the House of Lords in the case of the Crown and Barnet ex parte Sharp. That was a case about uh, educational uh, grants. And if we go to page paragraph 47, on page 209, Lord's government rejected the submission that ordinarily resident denotes a place where the student has his home permanently or indefinitely, i.e. permanent base or centre adopted for general purposes, e.g. family or career. This is the real home test. It necessarily means that a person has at any one time only one ordinary residence, viz. his real home. He also said, and it goes on to um, quote from the decision, that uh, the explanation, I don't need to read it to the court, of why it was that the judges in that case below had got it wrong. It's because they were looking too much at uh, policy immigration status when they should have been looking at a settled pattern of life. Now, it's at that point that I think it's probably best, uh, most convenient for me to pick up the Schlosser report. I think I can take this very briefly. Uh, as we know, the test prior to the UK's accession to the Brussels Convention for Domicile, which was being applied, was this real home test. We've already looked at the fact that it had to be given up voluntarily, there had to be an intention to do so. I heard it wasn't being applied for, for jurisdiction purposes, it, it was simply what was meant by domicile. It was, what was, meant, it was what was meant by domicile. From recollection, um, I, I would have to check it, from recollection, uh, at that time even, under the rules of the Supreme Court, domicile was a basis for service out of the jurisdiction of a particular person. So it had jurisdictional relevance. Maybe you're right. Anyway, yeah. uh, I, I don't think I... Uh, no, no, okay, keep going anyway. The concept of domicile, though, as it was going to be applied on the accession to the Brussels Convention, in the absence of legislation to change it, was thought by the Working Party yeah. to be unacceptable. Uh, the Working Party therefore invited legislation uh, draft legislation to be submitted. We see that at paragraph 73. Uh, the shall support that's on page 96 of him. Uh, no, in fact, on, yes, on page 96 of the official journal, uh, setting out that 
they invited legislation. The Working Party therefore requested the United Kingdom and Ireland to provide in their legislation implementing the 1968 Convention. That became the 1982 Act. That's the genesis of uh, our having the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments Act. Uh, for the at any rate, for the purpose of that convention, for a concept of domicile which would depart from their traditional rules and would tend to reflect more the concept of domicile as understood in the original states of the EEC. Now, I think the only point that need be taken from that is that it was a distinct move away from, distinct break with, if you will, um, the test of domicile being applied before the true home test. So that's how we come to be applying. Sorry, a distinct move away from the... The, the, the true home test, uh, the one which uh, was deprecated by Lord Scarman in Shah, and which was deprecated by uh, Mr. Justice Julian Knowles by reference to the Udney case. That that that's the that was the pre-existing test for domicile. So instead, the legislation now tells us to look at the concept of residence. That's our starting point. Then we go into substantial connection. So we've moved away from that test, and we should, in my, in my suspicion, what one effect sees in this case when traced through is an attempt to reintroduce that test by saying the claimant has a substantial connection, it's so substantial that he hasn't abandoned, he seeks, or he seeks to come back to his residence in the UK. <clears throat> Therefore, uh, you end up saying that he is resident in the UK. So in my suspicion, that would be the effect of it. The only other point to pick up from any of the first instance cases, paragraph 49, begins at the bottom of that page. It's a quotation from Mrs. Justice Carr in the Tugashev case. Um, what is said by reference to that case is, it is not necessary to have family home in the jurisdiction in order to be resident here, although the existence of a family home may readily demonstrate a central purpose. But she also said that the existence of a family home or the absence of a family home for someone with immediate family, as in our case we have has immediate family uh, in the jurisdiction may be a relevant factor. Now, however the House in Cumbria should be conceived of as an investment, as something to return to, it was not at the time the claim form was issued his family home. Because a family home which you have no right to enter without permission from your tenant uh, is a concept which, in my submission, is completely meaningless. Um, and in, in my submission, my learned friends refer to Chowdhury. Chowdhury tells us that you don't need to own or have current leasehold on a property. I agree with that submission. Uh, that's also not what Mr Justice Carr is saying you need to have in here. Chowdhury takes matters no further. It's a factor to look at. All of these things are just factors to look at. Um, Lords, again, lady, I, I think I can take the question of actual residence, which is most of what is left before coming onto armed forces and hidden implications, fairly briefly. It's that the claimant had no place to live in the jurisdiction, as we've already discussed. Uh, while that's not determinative, both the Bank of Dubai case, which we started on this afternoon, and uh, the uh, decision of Mr Justice Carr we've just looked at, make clear that that is instructive. Uh, unlike any of the cases cited to you, not a single other case cited to you, is that absence of evidence of the number of days a person said to be resident was spending in the jurisdiction. In the Oligot cases, we have flight logs, we have references to when they were in particular places. In this case, we have a vague reference to a holiday. Uh, we don't know the length of that holiday, we don't know the frequency of that holiday, we don't know what was done on that holiday. There is an, an entire hole within the claimant's case to say that he was resident here. Uh, the learned judge did find, as a matter of fact, that, that was a holiday. Uh, there's no appeal from that. The judge found that this was a position that had been taken up voluntarily, and I think that was conceded this morning, that the claimant wasn't posted to Cyprus. He chose to go there. He applied for the position. Uh, the court has, in my submission, the same issue as the judge did. Given the lack of information, we have one vague reference to a holiday a year. Is that really a basis on which to say someone is resident in the country? In my submission, the answer has to be no. We know where the claimant was living. He was either in category two or three of Lord Cave's different categories. He had a home in Cyprus. And there's no, there's, uh, my friend said that her primary case was that he wasn't resident in Cyprus. But there is, in fact, no appeal on that ground. The judge found he was resident in Cyprus. 
the, the grounds of appeal say that the judge shouldn't have found that he hadn't abandoned his position in the UK. He, shouldn't, he should have taken into account the fact that you could have more than one re residence. Does not, they do not say, it has not been part of the claimant's case, I thought until today, that he was not resident in Cyprus at the time. The judge made that finding, there is no appeal against it. It's also, to be blunt, perfectly obvious. We, we have the description of what his children were doing there. We know how his, how his life was established. He was receiving his primary care, he was working. I'd certainly understood the case to be that there was an appeal against the judge's finding on residence, um, and that was a finding that he was resident in Cyprus. And so, for my part, I thought it was a fair point um, to be taken by the appellant here that uh, the case was put in two ways. Either he's solely resident in the UK or he's dual resident UK and Cyprus. I'd always understood that to be the case. That, that may be that I've misinterpreted the grounds of appeal. Certainly in reading them, I am unable to discern, particularly the reference to the fact that the judge didn't take sufficient account of the fact it's possible to have two residences uh, as being an appeal against that finding. Uh, regardless, in my submission, if that appeal is being made, it's one which um, cannot succeed on the evidence as it was before the judge. I don't think I need to labour um, the points which are set out in the judgment as to what the pattern of life was in Cyprus at the time. And forgive me, because as, as the court will have noted, I'm using the word Cyprus where often I mean the SBA. Um, it's probable, it's at least possible, that where the judge has done the same thing within his judgment, he's picked that up from me. But there are references to the SBA. And in, in my speech, even in the most important paragraph, uh, which is paragraph uh, 21 from page 57, uh, the judge says, uh, this can be contrasted with a clear and settled pattern of the claimant's life at and around the SBA. He then also uses the word Cyprus in the same sentence, uh, in the same paragraph, but it doesn't take the length any further. So I don't think I need to labour any further the fact that the claimant wasn't in there. He comes within Lord Cave's second or third category, which means he's only resident in the UK if he has an establishment. There is no establishment which the court has been referred to. There is no assumption that it seems the court could be referred to. And in my submission, that is, in many ways, the end of the matter. Um, the final point, just to wrap up then, is the armed forces. This is, in my submission, essentially a policy argument. It's not been pursued full-throatedly today, but it is important. Before coming on to that, if I could, the, the word used uh, earlier, Lord Roger Sunhill, was hidden implications of this decision. Uh, it must be, it's not right to conceive of this as being a decision which will only affect such cases as are still progressing under the Brussels regulation. The work, what we're interpreting here is, yes, the concept of domicile, but the concept of domicile by meaning of the word resident, which is being used in the statute in its ordinary way. We've seen the cross-pollination between tax cases, jurisdiction cases, election cases, educational grants cases. Those are, those are the cases we've, we've been referring to throughout. Um, the decision the court makes today about what domicile means for this claimant is informed by those decisions and will inform other decisions in other contexts as well. Regardless, even if that weren't the case, even if we were simply in the jurisdictional context, we've already discussed sections 15A to E, the new sections 15A to E of the 1982 Act, Though those do, uh, actually, my understanding is exactly the same from Learned Friend, those rely on the same concept of domicile as we're discussing today. But secondly, it's my understanding that uh, the Rules Committee, among the various potential amendments to the grounds of jurisdiction in the CPR, uh, we have currently a ground of jurisdiction which is that the defendant is domiciled in England and Wales. It's not specified what that is. It's my understanding that there it's anticipated there will be some clarification of what that means, whether it's this definition of domicile or the true home definition of domicile, uh, which is anticipated to take place in the future. And even if that clarification isn't established... Well, who, who are you anticipating is going to give that clarification? The Rules Committee or some subsequent decision of the court? The, ru the Rules Committee have been... But if the Rules Committee doesn't do it, a subsequent decision of the courts will have to do well, it. So the Rules Committee, is this right, are looking at, which doesn't surprise me, at the gateways... Um, partly or wholly in the light of how much they need to be changed now we're no longer part of Brussels, is that right? Part of the Brussels regime. Well, and other, and other, and other. Yes. 
for, for other reasons as well. But I, yes. I thought they'd finished that exercise and promulgated the changes that were going to take place, and they come into force quite shortly, don't they? Yeah. My Lord may have the advantage of me that my understanding was that at least one draft, though, and it may have been superseded, or it may have found its way into uh, those which were promulgated, that my Lord has just referred to, uh, included reference to clarification of the concept of domicile. Uh, and, and that, in fact, my understanding was that it was being tied to the 1982 Act concept of domicile, so the concept which the court is looking at today. Th this is only my, to say my, that... My only query is, I, I mean, I had thought that the process was over. Uh, no, no, I think, I, I I think, see, you may have advantage I, I think it's done by an instrument signed by the Master of the Rules, not a statutory instrument, but I think it has all been signed and promulgated, hasn't it? And all that's left to do is for it to come into force the, on the appointed day, which... It is, a, it is a remarkable oddity that our whole law of um, of uh, jurisdiction depends on a practice direction. But yes, and I, I know, my lord, that um, you have looked in considerable detail at the history of the gateways in another case. Um, that th this is only by way of background to say that yes. uh, the court asked about what the hidden implications might be. Uh, this is not a case confined to. Yes, well, yeah, uh, speaking for myself, it was a. I can't believe it. it. It won't affect our decision as what the answer should be. That, that was precisely going to be my point, Lord. Um, this is a, a policy. Uh, this is not a policy case. This is a case of statutory interpretation, and in particular, when we then come on to consider the grounds of appeal, which refer to a special category for the armed forces, that can be discerned nowhere within any of the travel we've looked at. Discerned nowhere within any of the legislation we've looked at. Uh, it's something we know the court, it's something we know Parliament or the Secretary of State could have done. Uh, we know we know they're treated differently. We know that persons serving the armed forces are treated differently for other purposes. But moreover, in order to create a special category, in my opinion, the court would be in some ways binding judges' hands from doing the exact exercise which judges have to do, which is to look at the facts of the particular case before them and say whether or not there is a residence. My love friend has referred to very different natures of postings. That's something that the court should be able to take into account in determining whether or not someone is resident. That's not something which there should be, by this court, created an answer one way or the other. Um, my lords, my lady, unless I can be of any further assistance, those are my submissions. Not at all. No, thank you very much indeed. Plenty. Yes. If I can just come back on just a couple of things very briefly yes, indeed. Um, Leonard Friends adverted to the fact that in the Bank of Dubai case, home ownership was um, of importance there. That's only, of course, because that was the only factor that linked the claimant to, to the jurisdiction. And, and some caution is necessary when one looks at other authorities in relation to people who are for example, Russian oligarchs, we've talked about the oligarch cases a little bit um, this morning, this afternoon, people who don't have any other ties to England, whereas what we're looking at here is a man who has, um, who is an English citizen. And I say that it is important that prior to 2016, we can be sure that he was resident here. And that does um, mean that we have to exercise caution in doing, in looking at the cases which look at home ownership, look at the number of days, etc., etc., because the number of days only comes into play when you're looking at oligarchs who have international lifestyles or who at any rate um, never were resident in England uh, and that that was accepted on, on their behalf. Um, and I also um, pray and aid again, I'm, I'm repeating myself now but I, it's the last time I should do it, um, the fact that it is possible to be resident in two places and the answer to the question is he resident in England at the time of issue is not answered by um, the fact that he was present in or living in Cyprus at the time. You have to go further than that. Um, might I turn my back on the bench for a moment? Of course. I'm grateful. Unless um, the bench has any questions for me, those are my submissions. Thank you very much. Um, well, we will be. Uh, reserving our decision, uh, judgments in draft will be uh, circulated in due course under the uh, usual procedure so that uh, and they will be circulated uh, only to those addresses of which you've helpfully confirmed the court um, in the last 48 hours. Uh, 
and uh, any further circulation uh, in accordance with the principles in the Council General and Wales case will be the responsibility of, of those people to whom it is sent uh, and should obviously be restricted to people who need to see it for those purposes. Uh, we will be grateful for your comments on any um, typographical or other minor factual errors, but the primary purpose of circulation is so that you can agree a draft order, uh, and uh, if there are matters on which you can't agree, uh, that um, you provide short written submissions on the basis of which we will um, determine those issues in advance of the formal hand plan. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, sorry.